Hello everyone. Thank you so much for listening tonight. Um, I'm really excited to play a bunch of pieces. I have seven selections that I'm going to play for you. And uh, I'm going to get started right away. This is a piece uh, by Harry T. Burley. It's from a suite that he wrote for solo piano called From the Southland. And it is the first movement. The title is Through Moan and Pines. love the title of that piece. It's so evocative. It uh, conjures up a lot of images that go very well with the music. Uh, this piece uh, is part of a suite, as I mentioned, by Harry T. Burley. In fact, it was the only piece that he wrote, the suite, uh, for solo piano, because the bulk of what he's known for as a composer are spirituals. He uh, wrote down, notated many spirituals that had been uh, previously unnotated, and made them therefore general to, uh, available to the general public. And um, I mentioned in my email for this broadcast that it's all about connections. And uh, if you were with me on my first live broadcast a month ago, I played a spiritual. That one was notated by Samuel Coleridge Taylor, who um, also a black composer like Harry T. Burley, although not an American black composer. He was from England. But anyway, Samuel Coleridge Taylor uh, was very well known and very successful, mostly due to his work Hiawatha, which was an opera. And interestingly enough, Harry T. Burley was uh, the tenor who really made that role. And Samuel Coleridge Taylor considered Harry T. Burley to be the best interpreter of the role of Hiawatha. So I just loved finding that uh, interweaving connection between those two composers right away when I was putting this program together. We're going to hear more from his uh, suite later, actually, at the end of the program today. Uh, next, I would like to play a piece for you that is called Ishi's Song. It's composed by Martin Bresnik, who is still alive, a living composer in New York, and still very active. Um, but what I would like to focus on is Ishi himself. Uh, as you can see, Ishi is a Native American. He was born in 1860. Noticeably, uh, very similar to when Harry T. Burley was born. Um, and Ishii was 
a native Californian, which I am also, although I think Ishii's brand of being a native Californian is much deeper than mine. Um, but uh, he was the last member of his tribe, of the Yahis, and he lived most of his life alone and was not kind of brought into white culture or civilization until he was over 50 years old. Uh, he lived out his last years in a museum, curiously enough. They gave him a living space and they gave him a job as a janitor. Um, and when he died, his culture died with him. Uh, it was very interesting to find out that Ishii, in fact, is not even his real name. The only way that he would have said his name is if someone else from his tribe had introduced him properly. So, therefore, he never actually gave his true name to the white men. And um, it's a very uh, tragic loss. I think all of the Native American heritage due to the mass genocide, um, I think it's very sad. And I'm grateful to composer Martin Brednick for having written this song because I can honestly say without this piece, I would never have known Ishii's story. And um, so I don't think I explained that the word Ishii is just the word man in his native language of Yahi. Um, so likewise, this piece is actually uh, built upon a melody that Ishii sang, that's uh, hence the name Ishii's song. I'm going to actually sing the melody because that is how this piece begins with singing, but it's in Yahi and no one knows the actual translation. Uh, so you are free to translate it in your mind as you wish or just let the music wash over you. Uh, this is a really interesting piece because the melody actually is played over and over and over again. By the time uh, you're finished listening here, you will have heard that same melody over 100 times. However, Martin Bresnik layers it with uh, many different kinds of harmonies and other notes. Rhythms are kind of weaving in and out of each other, so feel free to let it just wash over you. Um, so this is Ishii's song.
forgot to mention bonus points for anyone who can tell me what time signature that was written in without looking at the score, of course. Anyway, I, like I said, I'm very grateful that that song exists. Um, I wish that Ishii or others like him did exist still. It's very unfortunate, uh, more than unfortunate. Um, and thanks to Seth Bosted for introducing me to that piece. Uh, the reason that I know about it is because I played it on a concert for Access Contemporary Music uh, a couple years ago. All right, uh, so now we're going to bring conversation a little bit more Chicago-centric. Our next composer is a personal favorite of mine. Her name is Florence B. Price. Uh, as you can see, she also lived around the same time that Harry T. Burley and uh, Ishii lived. Uh, she was not born in Chicago, but she did move to Chicago and lived a good chunk of her adult life in Chicago, so we are very happy to claim her as one of our own, so I will. Um, but in another uh, wonderful convergence of events, um, she spent a great part of her life as the head of the music department at Clark Atlanta University, which happens to be where uh, one of my students, uh, who I also mentioned in my last live stream, will be attending in the fall, uh, Cameron Barnes. So uh, very excited to see that little bit of overlap too. Um, Florence B. Price, um, was uh, one of the first women composers to have a work performed by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And I think that uh, right there um, earned her a great deal of respect in my book, for sure. She wrote a ton of music, chamber works, vocal works, piano works, orchestra works. Um, her catalog of piano music is quite extensive. Um, unfortunately, not all of it is easily findable. Um, but I do have this suite, um, also like the set by Harry Burley. It's a suite of pieces. I'll just be playing one of them. It's called Dances in the Cane Breaks, the whole set. And this is number nine from that set. It's called Silk Hat and Walking Cane. And again, um, I love this evocative title. I can just imagine any person, whoever they are, in a silk hat and walking cane, walking down the boulevard in uh, early 1900s in Chicago and enjoying the sunshine. Um, so please enjoy this lovely piece.
as I said, I love that piece. I love her music. All right, so we're going to keep it here in Chicago. We have another piece by a local composer. Um, this next piece actually is called Chicago Air, and uh, it is written by a friend of mine. His name is William Jason Rainovich. He um, is a cellist, a professor at Chicago State University, and a composer. And uh, one of the very first people in the new music community that I met when I moved here to Chicago 12 years ago and um, have sen has since introduced me to many other people. Um, we also are on the board of New Music Chicago together, and uh, that's also an organization that I feel pretty strongly about, um, doing great things for music here in Chicago. Um, so I was delighted to find this piece among his works for a piano that he sent me. Um, and I think that um, it's just uh, another take, you know, there's all sorts of music that comes out of Chicago, jazz, blues, classical, and uh, this is just another take. This is a very uh, interesting take, a very personal take, I think, from Jason's point of view on Chicago. Um, I love this piece. Uh, I think my kids have been hearing it quite a bit, and they love it too. Um, a couple things to listen for. There is The whole piece is written in the key of A minor until the very end, where there's a few accidentals, some notes that come out of the key. So if you want to be a keen listener, you can kind of try to notice when those other notes make their way into the piece. Um, another is a surprise, and so I'm not going to ruin the surprise, but notice at the end if you hear anything you recognize. Chicago Air by William Jason Rainey.
wait, did you recognize that ending? That is a tune. I'm going to play it one more time. Etc. That is Danny Boy, otherwise known as the Dairy Air, hence the name Chicago Air. Nice little composerly sleight of hand there on Jason's part. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed that and can check out his other pieces on his website. Um, I really did uh, feel strongly that I wanted to kind of celebrate Chicago. It's a great city and I think in need of a great deal of healing now. There's been so much violence uh, in Chicago and of course around the country uh, right now. And um, I think that um, we all need a chance to help each other, listen to each other, understand each other, and heal. Um, the next piece that I'm going to play is also by a Chicago composer, uh, our third Chicago native for the day, also a transplant like Florence B. Price. That would be me. I'm uh, from California, like Isha, uh, but have been in Chicago for 12 years now. And um, this next piece I was inspired to write within the last month. Um, the name of the piece is I Can't Breathe, and it um, is a sort of meditation or reaction or maybe uh, thoughts on the whole killing of George Floyd. I was just absolutely horrified to witness the violence of that on the videos um, and want to say that we should do better as a human race, as a country. We shouldn't be treating each other like this. Um, if nothing else, uh, we're all human beings and we should treat each other as such. Um, so this piece, uh, I would have liked to dedicate it, you know, exclusively to the victims of uh, racial killings or whatever, but it's uh, too long a list. So. This piece is simply dedicated to anyone who has suffered from racism, which is quite a long list. And um, hope that we can all ride the wave of action and protest and change that has been started and follow it to more real change in the world. So again, this piece is called I Can't Breathe and I wrote it about two weeks ago.
Thank you for listening. I hope it's not the last time I play that piece, but I do hope it's the last time I write a piece under these circumstances. Um, in any case, uh, there you heard it. That was the first time anyone's heard it. Uh, hot off the press, except for I haven't even put it in the computer yet, so uh, coming soon. All right, uh, so next I wanted to just give you a little bit of um, details. I have two more pieces to play tonight, but before I do, I wanted to remind everybody that um, if you would like to get more updates, uh, you can join my email list by sending me an email. You also can look at my website, although it will be under construction and hopefully uh, renewed in the next month or two. Uh, you can also click subscribe on the YouTube button and get notices because I do plan to do uh, more of these live stream broadcasts, most likely on the last Thursday of every month. Um, and also, I do have music available for sale. Nothing solo piano yet, but um, I did just recently record a, ch a cello and piano CD with music uh, by myself, composers George Flynn and Sebastian Hoitz. This is uh, me as the Wurzberger duo together with Allison Berger on cello. We're very happy with our debut CD. And if you order now, uh, before the end of June, I will also send you a free copy of my first CD, my string quartet music. So if you'd like either of those, uh, you can shoot me an email at the emails that I listed above. Um, also have the uh, website for New Music Chicago up there in case you want to know who else in Chicago is doing live streaming right now because of course we're, no, we're not doing any live in-person concerts. Um, the New Music New, uh, Excuse me. The New Music Chicago website has a calendar of um, other events by Chicago musicians. All right, moving on to another uh, big piece for tonight. This piece is a piece that I've played many times before, and as I was putting the music together for this concert, I realized this was the perfect piece to play tonight. Um, it's written by a black composer. His name, he goes by the name Hannibal. Um, that's his pen name. And he's mostly a jazz musician, uh, but he also works very well in the classical field. And as you can see in this piece, you'll, you'll hear both of those influences, the blues, jazz, and then also traditional piano writing are all at work in this piece. This piece uh, is called John Brown and Blue, and it is a programmatic work, which means it tells a story, very, uh, in this case, very specific story about the life of John Brown. John Brown 
was an abolitionist. He lived 1800 to 1859, and his life's work was vital to the abolition of slavery in this country. Many say if he hadn't done what he did, um, slavery might not have been abolished as soon as it was. Uh, so um, I want to read you. Hannibal provides his uh, explicit program notes of, as far as what is happening in the music. Um, they're actually quite detailed. I'm just going to give you the highlights. Uh, there's 10 things that happen in this piece. Um, in the beginning, you hear an alternation between his, this is all about John Brown, the abolitionist, his thoughts concerning the, na the madness of slavery intermingled with the feeling he got when looking at, oh, excuse me, his wish to live in peace as a farmer and minister. Next, it is the feeling he got when looking upon the face of the slaves he smuggled to freedom via the Underground Railroad. Next, the decision to take up arms. Number five, the love and respect he had for his two wives, the first wife who died and the second wife who stood by his side until his own death. Number six, John Brown's faith and submission to his fate and to his creator. Number seven, the killing begins in Kansas. Number eight, the attack at Harper's Ferry, the death of his sons and followers, as well as his subsequent capture. Number nine, John Brown's march to the gallows. Number 10, John Brown makes peace with his God and his world.
There it is. So, in case you missed it, that ending was the trap door that swung open under his feet as he was hanged for his life as an abolitionist. Terrible things that have happened in the world. Um, and powerful music uh, to reflect upon them, let us tell the story, let us know the story, so that hopefully such things uh, won't happen again or history will not repeat itself. <sighs> That's a hope. All right. Uh, unfortunately, I do have to say, uh, slavery, even though it's not uh, specific to black people anymore, still exists among us, unfortunately. As I know from um, one of the causes that the group called United Methodist Women Supports, it's a, a campaign against human trafficking because there are still many slaves among us. They're just hidden. and. Uh, sickening to me that that's still something that is very much alive in this day and age. More about the Methodists in just a minute here. Um, I wanted to say just a few final words before my last piece that I'll play today. Um, I'm very grateful to the composer Hannibal for having written this piece. I'm lucky to have been able to perform it many times in many different situations and uh, always find it compelling. I, I appreciate that it's music that tells a story and uh, maybe a story that many people wouldn't have heard before um, or would maybe inspire them to uh, investigate further the story of John Brown, what he stood for, what he did, or other abolitionists who have lived. Um, I think that um, we all can contribute in our own way to making change in the world and um, through music, playing it, writing it, um, us musicians can do what we can, uh, and so I'm happy to be participating in that way. Um, I did not want to leave you with the sound of the gallows, however, so I, as mentioned before, I'm going to now play the final piece from Harry Burley's Suite for Solo Piano. Uh, so we have began the program with the first, and we will end with the last. This is the sixth in the set. The name of it is A New Hiding Place. Again, he had an excellent gift for titling his pieces. Um, a new hiding place. What could that even mean? Uh, what are you hiding from? Why do you have to hide? Are you hiding for a game of hide and seek? Are you hiding for your life? Uh, could mean so many things. And um, this piece, uh, some of you may recognize, uh, it was taken up by William Farley Smith as he was codifying hymns for the hymnal. Remember those Methodists? Um, and this is a hymn in the hymnal. It is given words by William Farley Smith called, My Lord, what a morning. My Lord, what a morning. My Lord, what a morning when the stars begin to fall. Again, what could that mean? When the stars begin to fall, it could mean so many things. Good, bad, imaginative. Um, so you'll recognize the tune. And... Uh, We'll let him send us out on his note. Uh, very beautiful writing.
thanks again for listening. I forgot to mention uh, my connection to the Methodists. I actually work at a Methodist church. So uh, I hope you picked up on the threads that connected all of this music together, all of the composers, all of the people that uh, the lives were depicted in this music, and really the threads that bind all of us together as a human uh, species. So uh, make no mistake, the theme here was Black Lives Matter, and also that black lives have contributed very richly to the world that we all enjoy right now. And uh, let us never cease to fight for justice. See you next time, and thanks again for listening. Good night.